So I don't know about you guys, but I, I really was hoping that something magical was going to happen between the time that I went to bed on December 31st, 2020, and when I woke up January 1st, 2021. I was just really hoping that I was going to wake up in this just wonderful place and life was going to be so much better and, and the heaviness was going to be lifted and the sun would be out. I don't know, maybe some bluebirds would be, you know, speaking English on the windowsill or something. I don't know, you know, just a Disney moment. But just like you guys, I woke up on January 1st, 2021, stuck my head out the bed, and I'd say pretty much everything looked the same. Everything felt the same. It's funny how we just have this idea that, man, when we flip that calendar, everything's going to be so much better. And as I started thinking about where we are right now as a church and just where we are as a people and everything that's going on, I started thinking, okay, you know, this, this feels a lot like, you know, sort of like a, a, a wilderness moment. You know, it kind of feels like it might be a time in your life where maybe you feel like God's kind of quiet. Maybe you can't quite see where God is or isn't working. You're not sure what you should or shouldn't do. And anytime I hit those places, you know, in my life personally, you know, then I always go back to a time when I did hear, you know, very plainly, or I did get a thought or a word or a promise or something where I heard clearly an instruction from God. And it kind of helps get me through. So I kind of did the same thing. And I started thinking back to January of 2020. I went back to January of 2020 for us as a church. And man, it couldn't have been any more opposite than what it is right now. I mean, the atmosphere was pregnant with expectation. If you were here in January of 2020, we launched our Trailblazers series. We even picked the title Trailblazers because we were very much aware as a church leadership and as a church, we felt like we were heading into something huge. There was something God had on the horizon. He was speaking to us very loud. Very, something big was on the horizon. It was not the pandemic, okay? <laughs> Let me just give you a clue. God doesn't do that. He doesn't get you all excited and say, I've got a great promise for you. Merry Christmas, pandemic. No, that's not what he does. The truth is, what we're going through is a pattern that you see many, many, many times in the Bible. This is a normal thing that we're going through when it comes to being a church family, being believers, and walking with God. And that pattern is, there's always, what always happens is God delivers a promise. There's, he gives you a, a vision. He gives you a dream. He gives you something. There's something that, that all of a sudden ignites on the inside of your heart. And you're moving towards it. And then there's this period of time that passes before that promise comes to fruition, before that dream happens. And that period of time, can be any length of time and any length of different circumstances. But I like to call that time wilderness time. And the reason I call it that's the closest thing I can think of that is kind of like, you know, I, I love to hunt. And so years and years ago, I was out in the Francis Marion uh, National Forest and I was hunting in a very large portion of the forest there. And I've never in my life had any trouble with the directions or anything like that. So I found a huge chunk of forest and went as deep down into it as I could because I figured most other people would not. I was going to go find me just a primo place where most other people don't go. And I've been in the woods there for a while trying to find a spot. And as I'm walking around trying to find a spot, I all of a sudden realized I had just made a complete circle. I came upon something. I was like, wait a minute. I've already been here. And just like that, a little bit of fear sat in, a little bit of anxiety came in. It was getting dark. It was overcast. I couldn't see the sun, so I had no way to get a sense of bearing or direction or which way I needed to go. All I knew was I was in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows where I'm at. Didn't have smartphones back then. Okay, so I could put up my phone and go, there's my dot right there. There I am. Let me walk to the road. No, I couldn't do that. I knew, you know, in the National Forest, if you walk in a straight line long enough, you're going to hit a road, okay? Sooner or later. The problem is, I didn't walk a straight line. I walked in a big circle. All I had was a flip phone. And the battery on my flip phone was dying. So I didn't have much room there. And it's getting dark. And I know the universal thing for, you know, if you're a hunter and you're in the woods, you get lost. The universal thing is, you know, five shots, slow, into the air, says, hey, I need help. Come find me. Well, that's great if there's somebody there to hear it. Okay, I was in such a remote area, there was nobody there to hear the five shots. It's getting dark. I'm saving my five shots for what might happen in the dark, okay? 
Because I know if you're a hunter, you don't ever shoot at moving bushes or cracking twigs in the daytime. At night, it's fair game. I'm there, it's dark, I don't have a fire. Cracking twigs, moving bushes, boom, I'm shooting. All right, whatever's there needs to go the other way. So all this stuff is going through my head. And it just reminds me of that sense of, it's not lostness in terms of, you, you, there's nothing in you that says, oh my gosh, I'm lost forever. You know, it's not that. But it's that lack of direction. And all of a sudden there's a confidence that just goes away. Didn't have, you know, I didn't have a compass. I didn't have anything. I just had never needed anything like that. And a lot of times these wilderness experiences can feel like that. It can feel like not having a very clear sense of direction. It can feel like not being very sure of exactly what you should do next. And so it's that pattern that I felt like the Lord wanted us to focus on this morning. Because when you go back to January 2020, which I encourage all of you to do, go online Watch Pastor Mike's services for those Sundays in January. You would think he was standing on the stage right now dealing with what we're dealing with right now. They were words from God, and they were about a promise that was coming, something big that we're headed into, but they were also given to us to sustain us through what we're going through right now. The problem is we're so you know, short-minded you know, when it comes to... We forget that kind of stuff. Go back and watch those services. Because we're in this period of time, and and what God always does in these wilderness experiences is he doesn't waste anything. There is a purpose. There's a purpose for those times. And the purpose is to develop us into who we need to be to step into that promise or that dream. God gives you that promise. He gives you that dream. You hit this stretch where you feel like nothing's happening, nothing's moving, nobody sees me. It's not... In those times when you need to be the most careful about your choices and your decisions. Because it's in those moments that the enemy always, always, always comes. And he comes to us the same way he did to Jesus. We're going to take a moment and look at the example that Jesus set for us. Jesus came. Part of the reason for him coming was to give us an example of of how to handle the life that we have to deal with here on this planet. So what's going on is Jesus has been around, but he has not started his ministry yet. But now the time has arrived to start his ministry. So he goes down to the Jordan River and gets baptized to begin his ministry. And so we pick that up in Luke chapter 4. Verses 1 through 3, and it says this, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, and I want to focus on the three ways that the devil came at Jesus because it's the same way that he comes at you and I. Now, I'm going to to tell you what he says in the text, but I'm also going to tell you why he says it. The devil always tries to get a counterfeit in front of you. God has a promise. The enemy always has a counterfeit that he wants to bring in and put in front of you to try to distract you from the promises of God. That's always his plan. That's always the way he operates, whether it's finding a spouse, whatever it is. He is always trying to get a counterfeit in front of you. And the challenge for us is always to stay true to what we know God has called us to. And so that's what happens here. The first thing that that Satan says to Jesus is he says, man, and notice he comes to him. Satan doesn't play fair. He comes to him at his absolute weakest moment. 40 days, no food, no water. He is physically just at his weakest moment. That's when he comes. And the first thing he says is he says, man, I know you're hungry. And I know who you are. You're the son of God. So just go ahead, turn these stones into bread and eat Just go ahead and eat. Now, you and I, we look at that, we see stones, bread, eat, get food. What he's really saying, the implication there from the enemy, is that God is not going to sustain you. He is not going, God is not enough to sustain you. So you're going to have to take matters in your, and you're going to have to get a hold of what you need to sustain you. Now, it could be food for you. But it might be something else that just helps you to cope with where we are. I think we would all agree that we're at the 40-day mark. We're in that place where stress and anxiety and all, we are at a place where probably personally we're in a place we've never been before and we're vulnerable. And so the enemy comes and maybe his whole thing with you is food. I'm just going to tell you right now it's food with me. I am eating good. 
But maybe it's not food. You know what? Maybe, maybe you've been doing great. Maybe you've been living a life of wonderful victory and you've been sober for five years, 10 years, 15 years. Maybe you've been clean for a long time. Do not think it happenstance that all of a sudden you just start feeling some weakness and you start getting your thoughts. That is a supernatural enemy coming to you, whispering in your ear. Man, God's not enough for you. He's not enough. Just go ahead. Just one. Just one. That's all you need. Just one. Nobody will ever know. But Jesus comes back at Satan the same way you and I have to do. He comes back in every situation with God's word. And Jesus says back to Satan, no, I'm not going to do that because it is written that man does not survive by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is the son of God. 100% could have turned those stones into bread and ate it. He said, no, this is a test. And the test for me right now is, am I going to stay true and stay submitted to whatever it is that God's trying to do on the inside of me? And I am. I'm going to stay true to what God's word says. God is enough and he will sustain me. He's not going to let me starve to death. And when the enemy sees that that doesn't work, he doesn't stop there. He goes to the next thing. He says, well, oh, by the way, you do know that all the riches of this world, all the most powerful cities, all the, it is all under my control, and I could give it all to you just like that. Just bow down and worship me, and all of this is yours. All of these resources now will be yours. The enemy comes to us the same way, and the lie contained in what he's saying is God is not going to provide for you. He is not going to provide for you. You're going to have to find a way to provide for yourself because God is not going to do it. And there's nothing wrong with providing for yourself, but what the enemy always tries to get you to do is, hey, you know, a little bit of lying, a little bit of cheating, a little bit of stealing, that's okay. It's the world's way. What Jesus knew he was doing was he was trying to take things of this world, whether it is money, wealth, possessions, whatever it is, and elevate it to a point to where now Jesus begins to look at it and say, that is my source, that is my provision. And Jesus comes right back at me and says, no, I'm not going to do that because it is written in the word of God that you shall worship the Lord and worship him only. Now, Jesus knows we have need of all these things. Jesus himself said, look, your father in heaven knows what you need. He knows you need food. He knows you need clothes. He knows you need all these things. But the way to get it provided through God is to seek him first. The enemy's going to try to get you off track. He's going to try to get you to abandon what God's trying to do on the inside of you and go after it yourself. Go do it yourself. But we always have to find a way to pull back and to fall back on the truth of what God says and trusting God. It is all about, is God in this process or not? And then the last way that he comes at Jesus, which I think is the most sinister way, and when you read it in the text, It seems kind of odd because he says to Jesus, he says, well, hey, do this. Throw yourself off this cliff because God will protect you. He said he'll give his angels charge over you so they won't even let your foot touch the ground. So just throw yourself off the cliff. What's the implication? The implication is God doesn't even care about you. Now, if you want to prove me wrong, jump. If he really cares about you, he'll show up and he'll grab you before you can hit the ground. And Jesus, again, comes back at him with God's word and God's promise, which is, no, we don't test God that way. We have faith in God. We believe he's who he says he is and he does what he says he does. And so when he says he'll never leave us or forsake us, we believe that and we put faith in that. We don't test it. We definitely don't test it by trying to do something destructive in our own lives to see if he'll intervene. But how many people in this point in time don't think it, do again, Don't think that these thoughts are just coming from your own head when you hear thoughts like, it would just be better without me. Don't think it just thoughts in your head when you think, I don't even think God even knows that I'm here. Because it's not. The same thing is happening to you that happened to Jesus. And again, there's purpose in the testing and making those right choices. And as Jesus came back with the word and back with the word and back with the word, what happens on the other side? What happens on the other side? We see in verse 14, it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power, and reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. What's going on is in that time of testing, God is developing our character and our integrity. 
Will you keep your trust in me? Will you keep your faith in me? Will you continue to believe that I am on your side, that I'm going to pull through for you, that what I promised you is going to happen? And when we do that, we now become the people that we need to be because when this whole thing, here, here's the good news. Everything that God promised for our church in January of 2020 is going to come to pass. That's great news for us as a church, and it's great news for you because you're a part of this church. So there is something phenomenal that is about to happen in the Big C Church, of which we are a part of that family, Cathedral. Something is coming, but God is not going to waste the in-between time. What the enemy is going to try to do is he's going to try to, to sidetrack you. He's going to try to distract you, and Lord knows we've got so many distractions out there right now. There's only one thing that matters. One thing that matters is remembering the promises of God, staying true to who he's called us to be until that promise is fulfilled. So I was thinking about all of these things and I started, I started thinking, you know what? Let me go back and just look at a few of the things that were said. And so I want to do that for you because I want you, either you weren't here in January, so you didn't, you didn't get to hear some of the things that were said, but you were here, and if you're like me, you just forgot. So I want you to hear some of the words that were spoken on January 26 of 2020. We had a huge service that was capping off our Trailblazer series. The stage was covered with prayer requests. We had all the pastors on stage. We were praying over the prayer requests. We were praying over the people. And God was speaking through so many different people through that whole worship service. So take a moment right now to just remember these words that were spoken. Jesus, uh, after he performed some of the miracles, the Bible says this, that he sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. He put them in a sea and said, I want you to go. And so with, that's, all he, that's all he said. They didn't have much direction. He just got in the boat and they started off and then he left them to go be by himself. So this is what the scripture says. So a few hours later, they find themselves. It's dark by this time and all of a sudden a storm kind of comes up out of nowhere. The waves begin to rock the boat. The wind begins to blow the boat. And they wake up and they think, oh my goodness, what's going on? We're about to drown. And about that time, they look over and they see Jesus coming toward them. And he's walking on the water. I love that story. Because it tells me this, that sometimes in the middle of our storms when the winds of life is blowing and the waves are beating up against us and we think we're just about to drown. Jesus shows up walking on the water. Isn't that a great promise? I felt like the whole time it's been saying in the name of Jesus, as they've been praying, they've been saying in the name of Jesus. And ever since the service first started and they all started singing that song, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, my own children don't even realize the power that they have. They're not walking in the power. I, the name of Jesus is not something you just give, just say and it doesn't mean anything. But eat, and it's not something you have to wait for your pastor or someone else to say. But he wants you, if you're born again, you're a child of God. He wants you to know that you've got such power inside of you that when it starts getting a lot of turmoil in your home, you can walk to your door and you can say, in the name of Jesus, out. You get out. You don't have to wait for a pastor to come and do it. You. And that's what he kept saying. You, my kids have got to know the power that they have so they can live victorious lives. In the name of Jesus. I want you to just say it with me. We're going to do it over and over until it comes until it comes from down here and you know that you've got the power. You individually have the power. Amen. Not just us as collective body, but you. You have the power to say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to tell you about an event that happened one time. Years ago, Mike and I were, went fishing in this little boat. And it was things hanging all over the place. It was yucky. And we hit... 
It a, was great. What? It was great. It was a river. Yeah. It was great. Uh, yeah, and what it was a, a wasp nest that wasp we hit or nest, something? Uh -huh. And there's gobs of wasp. Now I'm, I'm gonna throw Mike under the bus here. He jumped in the water so they wouldn't get him. I'm out of that boat, baby. <laughs> unless they unless they can swim underwater, they're not getting me. But until but I was you... concerned about Dean <laughs> from underwater. <laughs> but. You know, I didn't even, it didn't go through my mind. It came straight from my spirit. Now, I said, in the name of Jesus, you will not touch us. And not one of them touched us. Not one of them touched us. Not one of them touched us. And I have a funny feeling that some of you feel like you, the wasp has been coming after you. They've been coming after your family. They've been coming after your children. But let me tell you, you have got to exercise that power Amen. of Jesus' name. And we're going to say it, okay? One, two, three. In the name of Jesus. Or again, in the name of Jesus. And you say it from you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Father. Amen. The old, the old church fathers used to have a, a phrase called common grace. And what was believed by the church fathers was that everywhere a church was in a community, that there was a common grace that would splash over that community because of its presence. Because they were there and God was there, then it would have an impact on the community. It would be just like you drop a rock and it splashes over. It was called common grace. So the grace that would go there over them would be a common grace. By common, it means that whatever they needed, it would help. It was common to their need, common to their suffering, common to what, what was going wrong. And that's the reason why a lot of times in those early days, they would put a hospital in the city when they started a church. Because now what would happen is that grace would splash over and people who were hurting would get help and would receive benefits just because the church was there. And we adopted that concept early on, the cathedral, recognizing that this is a place where y'all would hear about grace and hear about God. And, but then if you think about in concentric circles, here's where we are, and then a larger circle, where you don't have preaching services, but people who come in that sphere experience God's grace and God's love because the church exists. We just want to make life easier for you. We want to help you raise children. We want to give them a place to go on Saturday morning in the ball field where they can play, where families can exist. We want to be a part of that wholeness. We don't want to be a part of destructing and tearing families down. We want to be a part of a common grace to help them. That's the reason why we have a preschool here. Here's the common grace. You've got another circle where they just bring their babies and the preschool kids here. It's a place where they can be loved. That's the reason we have the academy, you know, from, from K all the way through 12. Because we exist, other people are bettered. Now I want to ask you a question. Because you exist this next year, are you going to make it better for people? Is there going to splash over your life a common grace? Friends, that's the real Christian life. I mean, that's the real deal stuff. I mean, it's, it's like it's helping, it's being there. It's like being God's hands and feet, just where you go. That's, that's the real deal. Will life be better because you exist? And it will be. I love going back and listening to that. And, and when you go back and you listen to the other Sundays in January, it is just you would think that we were in this moment that we're in right now. And back then there wasn't the pandemic. All this stuff wasn't going on. But those were the words coming from the Lord. Because here's the thing. God always prepares us for that wilderness experience. He doesn't just send us in and hope we make it. He prepares us ahead of time. And a lot of time we don't know that. But even the very promises and the words that he gives us are meant to sustain us like food through those drier times when we're waiting for the promise to come. But the hard part for us is remembering. Man, we have a short memory. And we don't have any trouble remembering what we do wrong or where we mess up. We have a really hard time remembering 
the good in our life. We have a really hard time remembering the good that we're doing or the good that God has done in our life. And it's the reason that God so many times says you need to remember. You need to go back and remember. I was even thinking about, do you think it's any coincidence that in 2020, God laid on the heart of our senior pastor to do a series on Joseph? In 2020, it just seemed like, hey, that'd be a good, you know, we can learn a lot of life lessons from Joseph. Man, if there's ever a story about what to do in the waiting, about what to do when everything is set against you and making the right choices and the right decisions, it's Joseph. So why did we do that in 2020? Because we need it right now. But we have to remember. Part of remembering that Jesus gave us is communion. So we're going to take communion. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now. We, if, for those of you that are watching online, by the way, just go real quick. you got time. Just you know, grab a piece of bread, a cracker, something, get you some water, juice, whatever you want to use. For those of you that are in the room, it's going to go a lot quicker for me than it did 9 o'clock because they helped me out and they went ahead and pre-peeled mine. It was quite the ordeal at the 9 o'clock service. So uh, you, you got you to be careful when you're peeling there. Don't, don't splash your juice all over you. But just go ahead, take your time, get it all opened up there while I'm talking. Because Jesus gave us communion and he literally said, do this in remembrance of me. And the remembrance has a lot to do with what you heard voiced on the screen. It has a lot to do with Jesus coming in our darkest moments. It has a lot to do with the power of the name of Jesus. And so Jesus knew that life situations and circumstances would be such that it would be hard for us to remember the victory that we have in him. And we would need to be reminded of that on a regular basis. So we're going to take communion. And the way I want to do it is to remember what Jesus did. But I also want us to go back and re-up what the Lord was putting into us in January of 2020 and get back on board with that vision. Because if you're like me, when you heard Pastor Mike talking about common grace and and he gave the challenge, because you exist... Are people's lives going to be better? I can honestly tell you, I went back and I thought, man, over the last couple of months, I'm not so sure. So I thought, I've got to, I've got to go back and re-up. I've got, to, I've got to get rid of the distractions because there's so many distractions out there because there's so many things that don't matter. Jesus said there's only one thing that matters and that is reaching the lost children of God with the love of God. That is a number one priority for every single one of us. We've got to be so full of God's grace and love that it fills us up and splashes over into those around us so that we appear differently than everyone is around us, so that we're not divided, so that we're not arguing so that we're not bickering so that we're about the father's business which is uniting and reaching the loss with his love so i want us to re-up around that and then you might be here or you might be watching online and say you know what eddie i god's not even a part of that journey for me like there's not really much for me to remember because i've never like had any kind of a dream or i've never really felt like the lord gave me anything to like look forward to and if that's you we want you to have the opportunity to make today the day that you allow him to come into your life. Because he doesn't barge his way in. But the Bible says that he's always knocking on the door of your heart. And all you got to do is open up your heart and say yes. And he comes in and he begins to do the work. So we'll make that a part of communion as well. The Bible says if you believe with your heart, that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised Him from the dead. You confess with your mouth, He's Lord, you will be saved. So you'll have the opportunity to do that as we go through communion. So as we take this bread, when I think about the bread, the bread, Jesus said, represented His body. And the reason Jesus had to go to the cross and the reason He was so badly beaten was that all of the sins of the entire world for all time were laid on Him and He took the punishment for it. And he came in one of the darkest moments in the history of the earth when even God's people, the Jews themselves, had not heard a word from the Lord in over 500 years. And God came into their darkness, just like Janton talked about, coming in the darkness, walking on the water, and his presence came. And because of what Jesus did on that cross with his body, now you and I, as believers, have the freedom to walk right into the presence of God. Wherever we are, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're going through, you and I now can enter straight into the presence of God because of what Christ did 
by allowing his body to be broken for us. So let's remember the brokenness of Jesus. And let's remember what God is calling us to in this season that we're in. And if you can put and release your faith in that and release your faith in Jesus being the Son of God, would you just take and break that wafer and eat it? And you heard Miss Dean say in that video, talking about the power of the name of Jesus and this juice, this represents the blood of Jesus. Jesus said, this is my blood. And what we know about the blood of Jesus is there is nothing more powerful on the face of the earth. What we know about the blood of Jesus is that when he voluntarily went to that cross and allowed his innocent blood to be shed, that it forever broke all the powers of hell over your life. All the chains, all the bondages, all of that was broken by the power and the blood of Jesus and is in the name of Jesus. There is no other name more powerful on the face of the earth because of the blood that Jesus shed for you and I. So as we take this juice, as we remember the blood that Jesus shed, let's remember the power of his name and the power of who it is that lives on the inside of you and the power and the authority that you have because of what Jesus did on that cross. And as you release your faith for that, would you take a drink? I want to do one more thing for those of you who may be in the room or online and you've never asked God to be a part of your journey. I'm just going to ask everybody if you would bow your heads and close your eyes and just very quickly, if that's you, and you believe what I've said, you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you do believe that He came, and He came for you, and you do want Him in your heart. Let's just everybody repeat this prayer right now. But for those of you that are believing that, and you're saying this for the first time, you are opening up your heart, and God says, Jesus Christ Himself will come in, forgive you of everything in your life, provide a way of forgiveness for the rest of your life, and join you in journeying with you and reaching the dreams of your life from now on and forever. So just repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I believe in your son Jesus and he's knocking on my heart. So I open the door and allow him to come in. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Give those guys a hand for doing that. That's a huge step. So I don't want to move too far past this because, again, this is about realizing that we're, we're not in a year with God. God doesn't, like, go by our calendar year. So that's why when we flip from December 31st to January 1st, nothing really happened. We, God operates in seasons. And so we're in a season, and God has delivered a promise for us and for you. And now we're in the season of waiting for the promise to come, to be fulfilled. And so we need to re-up around that. We need to think about that. So I want you to dial that up on the inside. I want you to remember and think about the things that have died in this season because of just what we're going through and how it's been, the dreams. Maybe there's, maybe there's something you've been believing for, for your family, for one of your children, for your finances, for a relationship. I don't know what it is, but I want you to dial it back up and I want you to remember it and I want you to meditate on it through this song. We're going to sing this song and you're going to love it, A, because Misty Sanders sings it like nobody I've ever heard sing in my life, including Judy Garland. Um, so if that doesn't give it away, it's Somewhere Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, but the song wasn't written for The Wizard of Oz. The song was written by two Jewish men. And it was written back in the days right before the Holocaust. It was written at a time when the Jews had just had all their rights stripped away from them. Segregation was beginning to happen so they could see the handwriting on the wall. They knew something bad was coming. But they had this promise from God and the promise from God was that Israel would once again be a nation. They didn't even have a country to call their own. But they knew because God said in his word that it was going to happen. And so it became somewhere over the rainbow. God's promise is coming. There's this place that God has promised us and we know that he is faithful and we know that we're going to it and it was this song that they could sing and when they would sing it, it would remind them, 
God is faithful. His promises are true no matter where we are right now, no matter what I'm seeing, no matter what I'm feeling or experiencing. The truth is God is in control and he is leading me to a promised land. So whatever that looks like for you, in whatever area, would you just bring that to mind and meditate on that and think about that and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you as Misty sings this song. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Maybe that could be a song that you could put on every now and then and again just remember. Man, God is bigger than anything that you're going through right now, than anything that we're going through. And you have a devil, you have an enemy, and his job is to distract you and get you off target because right now in the midst of chaos and darkness and hate and divisiveness, you're called to be different. People are to look at you and think, what? How come you're not getting swept up in all of this? How come you're not getting caught up in this world? You're like, man, because I got my feet on this rock. His name is Jesus Christ. And because I got my feet on him, I don't go swirling around like a Tasmanian devil. You know, I've got a peace down on the inside of me. And what I recognize and understand that he's put me in a place and I'm working around people and I'm living around people that they need to know and feel and experience the love of God. And the only way it's going to happen is through me. And so that's what he's called every single one of us to do. So I just want to bless you with the awareness that we are called to be that place of common grace where when anybody comes in your circle, whatever their beliefs, whatever, whatever it is, you love them. You show value to them. You care for them. You don't return evil for evil. You just give them grace upon grace upon grace. And I want to bless you with the stamina to hang in there to keep your faith on the promises of God that he gave us in January of 2020. Go back, look at those services, get it in you, keep it steadfast on the inside of you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And no daggone pandemic is going to stop the plan of God, okay? This is just not going to happen. So I want to encourage you, uh, next weekend we're kicking off our 21 days of prayer. It's how we started last week. Don't worry, there's not another pandemic coming. All right, we're going to kick it off. We're going to dive into God. We're going to get in His Word. We're going to get into prayer. I want you to be a part of it. If, if you're out there and you can't come, totally understand, be safe. But if you've been thinking about maybe coming back, come back, get in this room. Get around these believers and experience what it's like to be in the presence of other believers and to be worshiping God in this room. Thank you guys so much for being a wonderful congregation. Keep your prayers up for Pastor Mike and Mr. Hall's family. We love you. We bless you. God bless you. Amen. Have a great Sunday.